It's time for this week in virology, episode number 286, recorded on May 18th, 2014. Hey everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. We're coming to you live today from Boston, Massachusetts. We're at the general meeting of the American Society for Microbiology, a meeting that attracts thousands of microbiologists and is a really exciting place to do a TWIV. And joining me today to my right from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Great to be here. Nice and to I, have you yeah, next to me. Yeah, out here in Eastern Massachusetts for a change. Um, uh, Alan, and a beautiful day for it. It is gorgeous it's out there. Gorgeous weather, <coughs> lovely clear skies. Um, Let's see what the temperature is here. Yeah, probably ought to check on that. But uh, we thank you for driving out here, Alan. Oh, no problem. The traffic was easy. It's very, not very far for you, right? No, it's an hour and a half. It's not that big a deal. It's a small state. Kathy Spindler happens to be right here at the meeting. It's 17 Celsius. Okay. Cloudy. She's right down the hall running a session. So there's a concurrent virus session going on at the same time, so she couldn't join us. But we do have a substantial audience here. And you do know there's a virus session going on here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but you'd rather be here. I can't blame you, really. It's more fun to watch us be silly than to watch PowerPoint presentations. So we have two guests today. We have pulled from the meeting. And on Alan's right, she's a professor of microbiology at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, Julie Pfeiffer. Hi. Welcome. Thanks for, thanks for having me and for the promotion, because I'm actually an associate professor. But, oh, we promote everyone. Thank you for that. I don't have to go Absolutely. through the process. Well, you're going to get the TWIV bump. <laughs> okay. So. And you'll be a professor. You'll be a professor. Maybe when you go home on Monday, you'll when be a I land. professor. That'll right? be the first email you get. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> thanks for joining us. Been trying to get you on TWIV for a long time. Yeah. It's I was great supposed to you. visit, remember, and yeah. that fell through, but uh, thanks for joining us. Also, to Julie's right, his second time on TWIV. He's a professor of microbiology, Boston University School of Medicine, and the director of cell and tissue imaging at the needle, Paul Dupre. <laughs> <laughs> nice to be here, <clears throat> and for the promotion, but the, the, adva <laughs> the advantage for me is uh, my chair just happens to be sitting over there, so now he has no choice. That's right, <laughs> that's right. Uh, why do you look like a motorcyclist today? Why do I look like a motorcyclist? You got the, you got the red arm, the, big the sunburn. muscle. Well, I got the sun, sunburn yesterday because the weather has just Your shirt sleeves wonderful. rolled up. So you have a pack of cigarettes under there? Mm, not a <laughs> cigarette anyway, inside. Thanks for coming back, Paul. Yep, good Appreciate to be back. Uh, I gave you a bump too, is that right? Mega bump. All right, that's good. <laughs> we, we don't have a problem with that. So we're going to... Before we get into the science, we're going to talk a little bit about the needle, because we had some good news this week. But before we do that, I want to show you a t-shirt that Kathy Spindler gave to me just before the show. She got it from AAAS, I Speaking think. of needles. <laughs> wow, you're, nice. you're good. <laughs> anyway, it's, I brought uh, again. it's got a picture of vials of polio vaccine and some you know, angry looking syringes there. And it's, it's got a signature of Jonas Salk, I think, mm -hmm. at the bottom. I was just very privileged to interview his son, Peter, for TWIV uh, a couple of weeks ago, so you should check that out. On the back it says, this is just great vaccines brought to you by science. <laughs> That's right. Very cool. So thank you, Kathy. Poliomyelitis vaccine, which is here. This box is manufactured by Eli Lilly and Company. Uh, Indianapolis, Indiana, of course, and um, this is the 100th birth anniversary of Jonas Salk this year. So there's a big celebration. If you're in New York City in, um, I think it's October, they're having a big celebration. It's the virus you work on, right? It is. Well, yeah, and I do as well, so it's pretty cool. So Paul, um, there's been some news about the needle lately. Last time I saw you, we did the movie about the needle, which is a BSL-4 facility here in Boston. Yep. And um, about a tell, mile in this direction. Tell us, so tell us the hurdles it had to overgo to get to where we are today. The short version. The short version, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, the two most recent hurdles 
that it had to overcome was an ordinance which a councillor from the city of Boston um, proposed that BSL4 research in the city itself should not be allowed. Mm -hmm. so that probably was the first and foremost hurdle. Now this is after it had passed several other reviews. Yes, so it has gone through the risk assessments and secondary risk assessments and Blue Panel and the NIH have awarded that grant um, and this, the federal court have ruled, so all this, these different levels, but the two big hurdles was this city council ordinance mm -hmm. and secondly the state court of Massachusetts also had to rule in favour of the facility opening. So those are the two final pieces of the jigsaw puzzle, so to speak. Um, and, and this had been going on for a long, long time. The, the, the state court we knew had to decide, but the ordinance came a little bit, um, I guess, unexpectedly in the new year um, as, a, as an additional final hurdle to overcome. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, um, well, amazingly, on, on Wednesday, those two dominoes fell one after the other in the space of an hour. The ordinance was rejected by a, a, a good vote. It was eight to five in, in the, the city, city council. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah. So it was a, a, a really quite clear majority of the councillors looked at the evidence listen to the NIH, listen to the Blue Ribbon panel, listen to really science, mm. the, the, the fact that these facilities operate in many different places in the world safely, um, that there are a number of them in, in similar types of locations. In Atlanta, I, I've been in the one in Lyon, it's pretty much in the middle of the town. Um, and, and they basically decided, yeah, we, we trust BU to operate this safely. So they actually looked at other facilities and collected information. They didn't just make a gut-based reaction. Well, actually, the, the council were very thoughtful and they listened to BU. I think BU and the, also the opponents, the people who didn't want it in the, in, in the city, they, they looked at it and they had a public meeting <clears throat> now, unfortunately, I was uh, not able to attend that, but it was a six-hour, 40-minute public meeting. Quite dealing, impressive. Dealing entirely with the needle? Be dealing entirely with the needle. This wow. is the councillors listening to the community, uh, and BU is just one part of the city of Boston's community, so there's a community, everyone who, who has a vested interest in, mm -hmm. in Boston. Well, so, and there's a long tradition here in New England of having extensive public it's meetings. It's really about interesting. If you're not from this part of the world, which you might guess that I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Why would we think that? Well, someone told me once I had an accent. <laughs> um, yeah, it's really interesting. It's, it's very educational if you're, if you're from outside, what, what, what they do. And, and do you know what? It, it, it's not a bad thing um, at all. But I think what was pretty clear on Wednesday was the councillors had listened mm. and they had looked at the evidence. And by looking at the evidence, the hard evidence, not just this um, knee-jerk, this is Hollywood, this is real, what happens in, in, on Outbreak happens in Boston. You know, not that, because that's not the facts. They, they, they basically went with, with the facts, and it's pretty clear these can be operated safely in many, many places, and, and Boston is just a wonderful place to have it. Again, I'm not from here, but what do you know about Boston when you're not from here? Great universities, great pharmaceutical companies, small biotechs, knowledge economy. You know, it's such, it's such a, a, a place that, that should have, have the, as, as Elka, who was on the, uh, the last with, Elka said it's, it's like the Mercedes Benz of BSL4. Whenever she <laughs> gave her evidence to the, that, that uh, 
Council, that City Council. So, so you heard both sides during these presentations? Well, no, I, I wasn't right? there. I was at the Society for General Microbiology annual meeting, so I, uh, I had to deal with it by text. Ron was sending me a few texts in the middle of it, and it's still going on. It's still going on. <laughs> it's still going on. So what I had to do is take a look at, at some of the video footage, and it's, it, it really is quite interesting. I have not watched all six hours, 40 minutes of it. I can tell you that. <laughs> Well, we, of course, did a documentary of the needle. And, uh, everyone should go to twiv.tv and take a look at it. It's in the sidebar, Threading the Needle, which we did with you and Elka and Ron and uh, our team from ASM. So I, I would like to think that that helped a little because we did tell people to look at it. Yeah, and actually, to be fair, anyone, the, the, the needle leadership have done an awful lot with the community liaison committee, reaching out educating tours and anyone who mm. wants to come and see the building they, they, within BU and within the greater community they've brought people through it and just in the same way not to see all of the secondary space but to actually see the lab space so a lot of people have come through it uh, and visited it and I think that alleviates an awful lot of the concerns sure, sure. And, and for the people who can't do that you know, the people who live out in Western Massachusetts is not out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, since, since we made this, this documentary, I've been invited to two other BSL-4 facilities. Yeah? So I'm going to one in Australia this summer. Oh, you're going to Linfa? Yes. Oh, it's, cool. Uh, yeah. Geelong, right? Yeah, in Geelong. Geelong, sorry. Oh, well, I have an accent, so... <laughs> 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 and the other one is Rocky Mountain. You're going to Rocky Mountain, Hamilton. very good. So and I'm going to do a podcast from from both of them, so that would be fun. So thank you for the bump, right? So but but <laughs> the thing w w which is pretty clear, and actually this is really interesting, and, and at ASM, I think it's important to say that whenever we are here, mm. um, ASM sent, we, we had a petition. One of the things we wanted the City Council to see was that it's not really just a few people from Boston University. It's not just all this vested interest. There's a lot of people in the city, outside of the city, people connected with biotech who support this. And an ASM also sent that petition link out to their 37,000 members. Now I have to say, I've been a member now of ASM for, well, 50, yeah, 15 years. Um, and that really impressed me, impressed me. That basically validated every single membership uh, <laughs> payment because that's a society doing what a society should right. do. It's looking after microbiology. It's saying, you know what, this is important. It's not, okay, it's, 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 it's about Boston, but it's not just about Boston. It's not just about Cambridge, and it's not just about Newton and the other regions, and it's not just about Massachusetts. This is a national facility, but it's not just about the states. It's about all the other interconnectivity of science throughout the world. As you say, one in, in Australia that you'll visit, and one in Rocky Mountain, the, the, these other, other um, facilities. So I think I, I give an awful lot of credit. I, I really, I, I guess this is a good opportunity to say that, to, to support a lot of the people who follow the tweets and a lot of people who listen to TWIV and a lot of people, our scientists, friends and colleagues really, really supported us and we're grateful for that. Could, very, the, very could the council ever decide to bring this up again or is that it? I am not here and I'm not knowledgeable enough of, mm. of what they could do. I would say that that would be unusual. Well, there's an old saying that uh, no one's life, liberty, or property are safe when the legislature is in session. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but um, it would be, once the facility opens, yeah. it would become much more difficult to have I'll, a Yeah, I already that. think that by having, even the ordinance itself was a little bit like trying to change the rules of Scrabble once you were halfway into the it game. It was kind of a Hail Mary pass. It, it was a it very, was very strange. Have, yeah. yeah. So, but again, that's difficult. That's me looking as an outsider of understanding American mm -hmm. politics. <laughs> but, which I guess not too many people from inside understand either. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I would be very surprised. It doesn't really make sense. I mean, who's going to. There's so many other issues that those councillors, in my opinion, should be dealing with in, in Boston. And Needle was probably an easy kicking bag at one point. 
now it's sorted. Just let's do the science safely and let's, let's really use, use that facility and, and, uh, and make Boston biomedical sciences better uh, than what it already is. So when will it be open and functioning as a four facility? Yeah, when do you start actually working? <laughs> uh, me? I don't work. I've never worked a day in my life. <laughs> You're sunburned right now. Exactly. Why do you think I'm sunburned? <laughs> <laughs> um, th there are two other permitting hurdles to overcome. But that's, that's, that's a regular system that all of those BSL4 mm -hmm. facilities have to go through. So the, um, the Boston Public Health Commission have to give it the AOK, -okay, as do CDC. And that can be anything from, I think the quickest I heard recently was six months, but that's not going to happen in six months. Um, it can take anything from a year to, uh, I, I guess, two years. You would like to think that in two years it would be operational. I, I just really would hope that that was the case. Mm. But it's, it's a bit of a question, how, how long is a piece of string? Do <laughs> <laughs> you right. say that here? Uh, I've heard it. I don't know if it's a local. We plan. say other things. It's nice we to teach you. It's <laughs> nice to teach you people something. Congratulations. Sometimes. Yes, congratulations. <laughs> congratulations, Ron, and everybody at the needle. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. You you guys played a big part, don't you? I don't think so, but you did. We'll take it. Uh, yeah, no, <laughs> it, it, it 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 did. It's in the same way as ASM, in the same way. It's visibility. It's recognition. It's realizing that it's important. Yeah, I think we're microbiology is a community. And we, we live together, we die together, we, uh, we, we support <laughs> each other, and we should support each other as well, and I think it's really Sort of really a biofilm. Or <laughs> microbiome, yeah. It's a community. It's a community. It's a community. Sym symbiotic, yeah. Okay, we've heard that. It, yes. it's, it's good. It's By good. the way, speaking of questions, uh, anybody in the audience has a question, there's a mic here. You can come up. And also, those of you following online, you can uh, send questions via Twitter. What is the hashtag? To ASM 2014. Yep. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll hear those as well. So become immortalized like a cell line. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's talk to All Julie. of your dreams. <laughs> right. Let the healer begin. Live forever. Uh, Julie, uh, let's pay attention to you a little bit. Do you, know, yeah. do you know Paul? I do know Paul. We met in France, mm. as many will, I guess. <laughs> Last, at the European Society. For virology. virology in Lyon, the well, meeting that you decided not to come to. Yes, I'd had enough of you after the needle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, you're not again. being invited try back. Again. Yes, <laughs> there was a there was a good reason. Um, anyway, Julie, tell us a little. We know where Paul came from from the last episode 200. You gave us your history. You're did from I Bel from Belfast and all that? Yeah, yeah. So we don't want to hear it again. Boring. But Julie. Where, where did you grow up? Mine's far more boring than that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you don't. Have you been to Belfast? I have not. That's boring. Oh. <laughs> uh, I grew up in a small town in central Michigan. Belfast sounds more exciting. Belfast than is yeah. a good time. Um, it's called Midland, Michigan, mm -hmm. 35,000 people, very flat. And it's um, where the world headquarters of Dow Chemical is based. Oh. And so for a very small town, they have a very high percentage of chemists and physicists and and everything that goes along with that. So it was a great place to grow up and kind of grow in the presence of science and so forth. Your parents worked for Dow? Uh, my, my father did, yes. Chemist? Chemist. He can purify anything. Yes. Which cool. I, I need to put him to work because Get now him. I have yeah. things to, <laughs> to purify. Yeah, bring him in the lab. Yes. Huh? Hey, Dad. HPLC. You can, yeah. Nice. So that's where you got your love for science, probably? Right, yeah. Wat watching him and going into his facility with him, and, but, but mostly I would say it was from a really amazing high school teacher mm. uh, named Sue Shio, and she, we had a two-hour block for an advanced placement kind of class, and we did a river study in the spring where we'd go out and sample every week, and we'd measure biochemical oxygen demand in the water and nitrates and all these things, and my job was to count plankton, and so I kind of feel like I've been a microbiologist since the age mm -hmm. of 17, in a way. Um, so that, I, that really inspired me, and so I became a microbiology undergraduate major because of that. Where'd you go to undergrad? Uh, Miami of Ohio. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a liberal arts school, um, small classes. I had a great time there. Worked in a couple of, worked in a lab that was mm -hmm. great, Gary Jansen's lab. Learned how to clone, which served me well. And at that point, um, 
you took a lot of biology and you wanted right. to be a scientist already in college or? Right, I, I pretty much, I was more or less sure, not completely sure, but I mean pretty much day one I was a declared mm. microbiology major. Um, and I ended up taking a lot of classes that weren't required just because I found them interesting. Cell biology, things like that. I took an extra cell biology lab that was great. So then you decided you would get a PhD. Right, so I had done a couple of different research experiences. Um, I did a NSF fellowship at the University of Iowa one summer. And that was the first time I had worked with viruses. And that was in Marty Stoltzfus' lab. He works mm -hmm. on RSV. And I thought that was incredibly cool. And so I decided graduate school would probably be a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, and went to the University of Michigan and just had a phenomenal time there. I mean, it was a perfect match for me. Um, and I, I found that I had this problem trying to decide between should I do bacteriology or virology as my thesis work? What lab should I pick? Because I was kind of torn between two. Um, and in the end, virology won. But now much of my lab also works on bacteriology, ironically, mm -hmm. so it, it's, it all comes back. All right, and whose lab did you work in? I worked in Alice Telesnitsky's lab on um, <clears throat> retrovirus recombination on murine leukemia virus. Mm -hmm. um, and she started working on HIV around the time I was leaving the lab. But I was all strictly right. a model virus, model system, um, molecular genetics, those sorts of things, trying to understand mechanisms by which retroviruses recombine and aid genetic diversity. Right. So Alice was a postdoc in my department with Steve right. Goff. I of saw course. her on a daily basis. I don't know, was she there at the time you were there, Alice? I don't remember. Okay. So I you, you probably would have remembered. <laughs> okay. <laughs> she's, yeah. she's got a lot of energy. Okay. <laughs> so, you, so at that point, you were clearly on the track to being a virologist, mm -hmm. right? So then a postdoc. Postdoc came up, and I thought, you know, it's a very weird thing picking a postdoc, in a way. Um, and I thought, I, I want to switch viral systems a little bit and learn something a little bit new. I want it to be really tractable, but really I was shopping more for the, the mentor mm -hmm. than the project, if that makes any sense. Absolutely. Um, and so I interviewed in Carla Kierkegaard's lab, and you know Carla well. Um, and I was just very impressed by the fact that she had projects in viral genetics, viral pathogenesis and immunology using mouse models. She was doing some pretty hardcore biochemistry with purified proteins mm -hmm. and structure work. She was doing cell biology and autophagy, a few different viral systems going on. And I thought, that's a place where I can just learn. Lab meeting, you're just going to absorb all kinds of different mm -hmm. things every week. And that ended up being key. That was kind of everything. Carla's brilliant. Yes. I've known her since I was a postdoc because as I was leaving the Baltimore lab, she was mm -hmm. coming in. I handed her my clone of the polio genome. <laughs> Which, thank you, because that's what we use. <laughs> Gee, it's the same yeah, one. Yeah, it's the same one. Yeah. Vincent's given polio to everybody. I have. <laughs> yes. um, but at the time, of course, this was before, or was this before the eradication goal was? So Set? I joined in 2001, it's after. and it was right around the time when everybody was, um, there was a decree, mm -hmm. uh, as if from the Pope, that you were to catalog your freezer stocks. And this is a big problem because a lot of people have fecal samples from kids in India, and they don't work on polio, but their freezer is full of mm -hmm. polio. Right, so it was this concern. Yeah. Or they have vials that are labeled Coxsackie virus that are right. full of polio. Right, right. Yes. But I mean, people just studying Vibrio cholera or whatever, I mean, there's yeah. polio in those stocks too. Um, so it became a concern. And, and when I started in Carla's lab, I, I wanted to work on polio. I'm a huge fan of model systems. Um, I kind of joke in the lab that I don't want to work on a virus if there isn't an infectious clone for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I really like the polio system. I like the power of it. I like what you could do. But I got a little nervous at that time because mm. um, there was this feeling that perhaps funding for polio research might, might get reduced, even though you can use it to understand a lot of things. Um, and so I, I did take on another viral system just in case to kind of, as a backup. What was that? Hepatitis C virus. Okay. So yeah, I mean, and then eventually you started your lab, mm -hmm. which is focused on polio. Yeah, so it, 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 initially, yeah. You didn't worry about the eradication and how it would affect research. I worried about it. <laughs> I mean, I guess it didn't 
yeah. stopped me so much. I mean, I guess I was really interested in the power of the model and the power of the genetic systems and just really interesting questions that in spite of 100 years of research, we still didn't understand. We still don't totally understand why did so few pe people become paralyzed. Even in the pre-vaccine era, less than 1% of people that were infected became paralyzed. And why was that? What limits dissemination in most people? You know, most people never even knew they had it. So, so what's good in them and bad in, in others? Right. And I thought that was a great model to be able to understand how a lot of neurotropic viruses move around the body and, and so forth. So I very much started my lab um, on polio and hep C. My, my very first student, her whole thesis was hepatitis C virus on a completely unrelated hmm. project because I, I was a little bit worried about having all my eggs in one basket. But the, the polio stuff panned out and it ends up the things that we're learning with polio are applicable to a lot of other viruses. And so people I think are a little bit more willing to listen now hmm. perhaps. And, and we've also taken on a lot of new viral systems in the lab. We have Reovirus, Coxsackie virus, Tyler's, EMCV, yellow fever. I think, I think also that. if funding becomes tight for polio, it's not as if that's a unique problem in the polio field. Right, that's a problem for everybody, yes. So this idea of model systems is, I mean, the, the appeal of model systems has gone up and down over the years. At one point they were loved, and then there was a phase where, you know, if you wrote a grant application and used the word model systems, it would be a problem, mm -hmm. because the idea was to work on relevant pathogens. But now we are coming back to where model systems like polio are valuable. And I, 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 I saw so. that. I saw that in all the years of, of applications. It was harder at a time when, because polio is a model system. Right. You know, almost eradicated, it's hard to um, say the research is good for anything else, although there are some post-eradication applications, of course. But uh, it's a great model system. In fact, I have used your papers, both as a, as a postdoc with Carla and from your lab. I use them in my courses all the time because they're great examples of how studying a model system can illuminate all of viral problems. Um, so I want to talk about this cool observation that, that you made where you say your interest in bacteria and virology mm -hmm. came together. The idea that the microbiome of the intestine is involved with polio replication. Maybe you could tell us how you got interested in that. Right. So, so that, was a, that was an interesting circuitous route to something that became really, really interesting. So this was all um, started with a graduate student, Sharon Coos, who is a TWIV listener. So if, Sharon, if you're out there in the universe. Um, um, and she was my second student in the lab, and she was interested in looking at viral dissemination and host barriers that limit viral movement. Mm -hmm. And in her first study, she found that the gut was a major barrier that impeded polio virus dissemination out of the gut that limited its dissemination to the central nervous system. Um, and so we became interested in the gut as a barrier and what might be going on. And so we came up with this hypothesis, you know, that the microbiome is so big, you know, the last 10 years or so. Um, we thought, I wonder if bacteria in the gut are somehow protecting the host because they're known to protect the host from, you know, salmonella infection, you know, mm -hmm. these pathogenic bacterial infections. And we wondered maybe if something similar was going on with viruses. Um, so we kind of had this hypothesis, you know, you jot down all the hypotheses that you come up with and then you kind of pick which ones to prioritize. And I, I would say that if it hadn't been for uh, a specific colleague, that hypothesis would have been very low on the uh, priority list because I'm not a gut person. You know, I, I had a little bit of training in bacteriology, but not very much. And the gut is a very scary place. I mean, there's a lot going on in there. Um, so the entire reason we started this project is my colleague, Laura Hooper, um, who spoke, was that last night? Last night. night. Last yeah. night. Um, she is in our immunology department. She's a joint appointed in, in our department. And basically she's my best friend and we drink together twice a week. <laughs> um, she comes over and we have drinks and dinner on my patio and we go out with friends um, Friday nights. But we talk about science and other things on this patio, and we talk about ideas for projects, and there have been a lot of projects born on that patio, um, including one of hers we were just talking about, I wonder if circadian rhythms in the gut do anything. And then, you know, flash forward two and a half years, it's a science paper, you know, and we were f mm. followed the course of this project. So this was very much one of those times where just talking to a colleague that works on something a little bit different from you can be really good. So she said, Interesting hypothesis. 
send Sharon up to my lab. She can talk to my students and postdocs. They'll set her up. We can tell her what antibiotics to use. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's how it was born, was just out of that. And it ended up being that we were totally and completely wrong. Our hypothesis could not have been more wrong, which I find more exciting, actually. Mm. It's kind of fun when biology is smarter than you are, which is always. <laughs> um, so Sharon found that if she depleted gut microbes by giving the mice antibiotics, that the virus no longer replicated and then the mice survived better. Um, and we were expecting the exact opposite result. Mm. And so then it became this interesting phenomenology um, and it took us a long time to get some traction on it. There were a lot of twists and turns. We were misled a lot. You could ha have a whole episode with Sharon talking about um, her misspent year. <laughs> um, but in the end, trying to figure out what's going on, how is this all working, ends up being the big challenge. And we're still working on that now. Um, so which mice background do you use? What, what, what's the... The I... genetic background. So these mice, so... Normal mice are not susceptible to polio. So these are the trans these are transgenic These are transgenic animals. mice that okay. express the okay. human polio receptor, okay. which Got he up. has generated some. These are Rebel's mice, right? Yeah. Well, actually, well probably, are there, probably not because... Right, because that one, yes, got locked Columbia up. Wouldn't Columbia's wouldn't let me give them to anyone. Office, yes. yes. Anybody from the Columbia Patent Office who's listening, that was for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't ask that question for that reason. I just wanted to know yeah. which No, 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 yes. <laughs> we're just looking to complain. Well, and they're, and they're Sorry, also... we digress a little bit there. And <laughs> Sorry, it is, that's politics. politics. <laughs> so you use someone else's transgenic. We use Satoshi Koike's because they also lack the interferon alpha beta receptor. So they're immune suppressed and then they have the polio receptor, and so they're orally susceptible right. that way. That's the only way to get them. Right. Orally if wild type mice, even if you have the receptor and you feed virus, it doesn't replicate? Is that correct? Uh, not well at no. all. Um, and that was a big problem in the field for you know probably yeah. 10 years. You and others tried to right. get polio to um, you know, infect mice by the oral yeah. route, and people went to heroic efforts. and with Satoshi Koike in Tokyo who figured out that if you take away the type 1 interferon receptor, then the virus will actually replicate in most tissues wherever mm -hmm. there's a receptor. Right. So those are the animals you use for your That's studies. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we use the immune competent versions as well to, as a comparison. It turns out the virus replicates a little bit. It replicates kind of okay in the gut of immune competent mice, but it doesn't disseminate out of the mm -hmm. gut. So it's a post-gut block that interferon is. Okay doing. So when you depleted the gut microbiota, then the virus replicated to lower levels? Right. It, it basically hardly replicated at all. Mm -hmm. And the mice survived much better, as you might predict. Um, and so then the big question becomes, why is that happening? Mm -hmm. And we're still pushing on because we've identified some mechanisms that might be going on, but it may not be the whole story. Sure. Um, so one mechanism that we've been characterizing are effects on the viral particles themselves. So there are a lot of labs looking at the effect of microbiota on innate and adaptive immune responses that then can have effects on viral mm -hmm. you know, replication. Um, we started by looking at viral particles. And what we found is that bacterial surface polysaccharides, including uh, LPS, which is on gram negatives, or peptidoglycan, which is on gram positives, both of those polysaccharides will bind to the viral particle. And we figured out a lot about the requirements for what the, polysac what, what the polysaccharide mm -hmm. needs, but both of these things work. Um, binds the viral particle and it does two things. The first thing is it aids the virus attachment to its receptor, which obviously might assist its replication process. Um, and the second Where thing- Where is that binding in the capsid? Because there's a, there's a pocket for yeah, antiviral drugs. Right. Lipids. Right. It's, well, the truth is we don't know the exact binding site. We actually have a mutant that binds less, but it's a conditional mutant, so it's a little bit complicated. We, don't, we think the binding site is probably nearby. Okay. Um, this particular mutant's mm. in VP1 okay. uh, near the fivefold. Uh, for those aficionados yeah, sorry, that know sorry, what that yeah. means. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Talking. A little shop. inside there. Oh, yeah. we, we shouldn't talk about viruses. On no, we shouldn't talk about viruses. <laughs> yeah, we should talk at least at a level that other people can understand. There's, there's, a, there's a history of, of um, 
odd molecules binding to yes. the virus. So the, vi the receptor binds around the five-fold right. axis. Right. In fact, you can see a picture of it here on my yes, phone. Yes, so with logo, as see, a this, is, fact. this is polio <laughs> binding its receptor. You can see the five-fold axis of symmetry. So uh, the question is, do, does LPS bind in the same it's, around it's, that? it's around there, around but not that exact site, which would okay. make sense. Right. Um, yeah, so it aids receptor binding. And the second thing that it does is it stabilizes viral particles and it makes them resistant to heat, and it makes them resistant to dilute bleach. Hmm. Very dilute, short period of time. We can, we can definitely kill it, don't worry. Um, <laughs> From what temperature? Uh, it'll survive 42 degrees, six hours, no problem. We've gone much higher than that. It'll survive. Uh, and without it, what? Dead in, in less than an hour. Interesting. Yeah. Hmm. So what we're, we're trying to so do now So it's stabilizing the particle and helping receptor binding. Right, so the stability, we think, it, that doesn't matter so much for the actual infection of the primary host mm -hmm. because you, eat, you ingest polio and it's gonna replicate within a couple hours at body temperature. That's right. no problem at all for the virus. We think it's more important for transmission. So viruses have to be stable mm -hmm. in the environment. So for, as gross as it is, fecal orally transmitted pathogens, they need to be stable in the environment long enough to be picked up by that next host. And so we have this mutant virus that doesn't bind quite as well and it's not stabilized and we can show that it has a transmission defect mm. um, in mice if we age the feces out before we use it for the second. You infection. age the feces, like oh, steak, yes. right? Like, like wine. Like wine. <laughs> yes. We do. We age, it's a nice, it's a, it's a I believe a four day room temperature Your lab cure. smell great. <laughs> it's down the animal room. <laughs> No worse than any animal. So, uh, <laughs> but in the mouse, LPS and other surface material are important for replicating in the mice. So the transmission right. issue is something else. Transmission right? issue is something else. So that primary cycle in the host, the receptor thing might have something to do with it, mm. but there are probably other effects, things having to do with innate immune priming. Mm. And in fact, there are a lot of other groups working on this, and they have really good evidence um, a great example is Tanya Golovkina's work. Mm -hmm. So our papers right. were published back to back, which was great for both of us, obviously. Um, and she works on a mouse retrovirus called MMTV, totally unrelated to polio. And she found that it too binds LPS and that the virions that are bound to LPS initiate a very specific kind of innate immune signaling that culminates in mm -hmm. IL-10 mediated mm -hmm. immune tolerance. So it allows the virus to keep replicating under the radar. Essentially. Now, LPS is not specific to any particular microbiota. It gram negatives, mm -hmm. and there's a wide array of LPS types and the kinds of glycans that are that'll that'll do this. Right. So soil microbes would probably be right just as good for polio as right. It's an interesting question, actually. Right now, Chris Robinson in the lab is screening through. We basically went to the Med Micro Lab where they have like every bacterium you can imagine, and said, yes, <laughs> we'll take all of these. And so he's screening for activity against uh, poliovirus and a bunch of other picornaviruses, Coxsackie B3, Tyler's, EMCV, Rhino, um, to see if, if, do they all work, you know? Um, so it's kind of the pan. So and rhinoviruses would be a tract pathogen. Right. And I'm sure there's a microbiota of the mucosa as well, right? Right, there is, but it's not nearly um, the numbers in the gut, yeah. right? Um, so rhinovirus, we might expect, might behave differently. We don't know. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of interesting to So right now, you just know polio viruses, it has this property right. in the gut. Well, and, and Coxsackie B3 also. Mm -hmm. And do you know, do you have any way of knowing whether this is the same in people? Because everything's in right. mice so far, right? Yes, we have no way of knowing in people. People have asked, well, have you looked back in the old literature to see if there's any correlation between antibiotic use at time mm. of a, you know. Right. Polio infection. And, right. Endemic, right yeah. And I wouldn't even know how to start something like that. And, and the truth is, I wouldn't really expect there to be an effect because Sharon did some experiments where, so we use four antibiotics at very high concentrations that would never be achievable in a human. Mm. Um, so we really knocked down their flora. And it turns out if one of the antibiotics went bad without her knowing, and in that experiment, instead of getting a million fold knockdown of bacterial count, she only got a thousand fold. And then polio was perfectly happy. Um, 
to replicate. I think you need to get human feces clearly and do the experiment. <laughs> Aged. Do you, Aged. Do, do you want to do a sabbatical? Yeah, I'll do a sabbatical. Uh, if I can sit in on your... Uh, on my, the patio? Yeah, the patio. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you're willing to work, age human feces. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. It's a day. He'll leave them on the patio for you. <laughs> so basically... Um, the I knew it would be as bad as this. I knew this would happen. <laughs> <laughs> it's just I have, I have a I always go there. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything there. <laughs> it's a don't, family show, don't, by don't, the way. Don't, don't. The, uh, so basically, the virus has evolved over time to be able to, to benefit by stabilization or some other thing right. in the gut, right? It makes perfect sense. You might as well use the community. Well, that, that's, that's the whole there. thing about evolution with viruses. So, so RNA viruses, hmm. as polio is, they evolve a million fold faster than we do, than bacteria do. So they're not, it, it, it just makes sense. And they undergo s replication so quickly that there is such selective pressure on these populations that if one has even a tiny advantage, it will very quickly take over the whole population and benefit from what's there. So it makes sense that the viruses have evolved to yep. use what's there. I, use, I make this statement in, in my evolution lecture. So humans and chimps differ by 2% of their DNA. It took a million years to achieve that. Polio achieves it going from the mouth to the intestine. Yeah. So imagine what polio could do with a million years. That's right. So I view it, earlier you talked about this, um, this question of why the virus doesn't efficiently get into the CNS. I view it as an accident. I think this is mm -hmm. an exquisitely adapted human virus to the gut. Agree right? completely. I mean, most people you get an infection, you don't even know you have an infection. The virus replicates for weeks very efficiently. It's spread and you're fine. But maybe, and then one in 100, one in 200, it gets into the CNS. I think it's an accident because there's no good to a virus to getting in. It's that. a total accident and yeah. it's a dead end. Right. I mean, what's the benefit? You're not going to be transmitted from the spinal cord. Yes. Right. In unless you're an animal eating another. Well, that, that's animal, what I right? thought about before is maybe precursors of poliovirus that were not human specific. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If there would be some predator prey thing where eating. A paralyzed mouse would give it to the cat, yeah. Something like that, but I mean, why would, why would it be maintained for polio when it confers no benefit? Yeah, right. Yeah, right. We actually don't even know where polio evolved from, unlike yeah. many other viruses where we kind of, your virus, measles, right? We sort of know. <laughs> well, you're so, you, I mean, it really is interesting listening to you because it's very, what you're saying for polio, there are so many nice parallels with measles. Measles mm. is a dead end in central nervous system. In fact, mm. it's, it's, an, it's, it's an accident that it ends up in the CNS. But that's what I was just going to ask. Where, where do people think polio came from? Because ultimately, what we imagine is they're coming from animal reservoirs mm -hmm. at some point. Sure. So we're so human focused yeah. with our viruses because well, and there when are, you're not working with model systems, what are you working with? You're working with viruses. And there are plenty, there are plenty of other, other intestinal viruses and even picornaviruses that never have any neuropathogenesis. So That's right. why is it that polio has question. this? There, yeah. may, maybe there's something about its particular um, evolutionary path that yeah. has left it with this unfortunate side effect, or maybe there was some advantage. We have no idea where where polio originated from. So, so you your see, virus right. probably came from rinderpest? Well, that, that probably is, it, it, it's, who knows? It's an idea, but it's we don't even idea. have an idea. It came from polio. some sort of old... Because uh, the, there are no polio-like viruses out there that we have discovered. Maybe we have yet to discover them. We need to go out and you know, look for picornal-like viruses in the wild, but we have no clue where it came from, so we can't even speculate about why it would have been in the CNS at all. But you I, see, if, I, if you see something like Nipah virus, Nipah, yeah. Nipah, which could be, uh, because it is jumping from bats into people and bats into pigs and much, many, many more central nervous system complications there. So what measles is now, very, very tuned exquisitively to people, just like mm -hmm. polio, exquisitively tuned to people. That's why the animal model is so hard to make. Yeah. Nipah, Nipah and measles could have been much more similar whenever you, you look back in, in, in evolutionary history, whenever measles, whatever it came from, was initially jumping out of that animal species. Yeah. I, I always like to compare polio and, say, neurovirus, where, so polio gets in, it replicates, most of the time there's no symptoms and it efficiently spreads nonetheless right. without being pathogenic. And norovirus, as you know, bam, you get infected and woo, two buckets. Also efficiently right? spreads. 
<laughs> and it efficiently but, spreads. But, but there, it, the difference is the pathogenesis there aids transmission. Yes. If you yeah. can aerosolize feces, yes. transmission. I understand, but you don't have but to. But why didn't polio ever? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> why? Why? Yes, yes. I'm so glad I work with Go try that at home. Yes. Simple yes. respiratory yes. virus. Hopefully people aren't eating during this. It's ASM. They don't care. <laughs> that, I'm thinking about the people. Will opinion. that be part of my sabbatical work? <laughs> it, whatever you want to do, I'm happy to accommodate. <laughs> if you but, write the safety plan. No, you're right. <laughs> Aerosolization is a great way. You know, it spreads on airplanes like that. Right. So why didn't other poor exactly. viruses pick so up? Exactly. So you don't on, have yeah. to. Well, the answer is that whatever path to transmission you, you achieve when you evolve works. It doesn't have to be just one path, I suppose. But neuro is quite virulent, right? Yeah. And being virulent is a good way to achieve transmission, either by vomiting, diarrhea, you know, coughing and sneezing. But there are other ways too, I suppose. That's the only way I can really And also, each of these it. viruses got to its current point through some path, which has left it with molecules that may not be ideal for its current lifestyle. Yeah. So it's constrained. Yeah. Polio, particularly with a tiny genome and tiny mm -hmm. capsid, it's very constrained in what it can change and maybe it could change something to get around neuropathogenesis, but in, you can't get there from here. Right. That, that path has been mm. lost to yeah. it. Possibly. It's very interesting that we have had to immunize globally against an accidental infection of the CNS, right? right? But of course, that's what we see. Paralysis is a serious consequence. Right. So now, are you you're trying to sort out the details of why not, it's not just LPS, but there are other things you're trying to sort that out as well. Yeah, so we're trying to figure out, you know, what are the glycans that can do this and do some do it better than others and trying to hone in more on the specific molecular mechanism of, right now we're, we're really focusing on stabilization. Mm -hmm. um, and we have this new hypothesis that we've been testing. And this is the idea that since each viral particle has 60 capsid proteins. There are 60 potential binding sites right. per variant. And we know that for these polysaccharides to have activity to stabilize the virus, they have to be long. Mm -hmm. So we can use little six unit long oligomers and those don't work, but yeah. the longer ones do. And so one hypothesis we thought of was, what if they're clumping viruses mm -hmm. because they're binding the same you know, polysaccharides and, and it got me looking back into the literature, and some of my favorite things to do are to look in papers from the 60s and 70s, because there's such good stuff there that <laughs> um, my student just gave her presentation last week, and she showed a picture from a paper from 1961, I think it was. It was great. Um, you, were, but, you weren't born at the time, but I, I remember being alive. <laughs> Neither were you. No, I wasn't around in Neither 61. were you. Oh, nope. man, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, so we have this hypothesis that maybe these things are aggregating, and if you look in the literature, um, people have seen viruses aggregate in labs. Yeah, I mean, this sure. is a big thing that in labs, you don't want your viruses perhaps to aggregate because it screws up the plaque assays and all these things, and you don't know what you're looking at. But everybody fights this problem. And in the, mainly in the 70s, people were concerned about it in sewage, Getting back to my favorite topic. <laughs> um, in wastewater, because viruses can aggregate in wastewater under certain conditions, and they become very, very resistant to inactivation. Um, so that's obviously a problem for wastewater treatment. And so there were all mm. these papers looking at what induces viral aggregation and that the fact that they're hyper-stabilized. And I thought, well, that kind of sounds familiar. So we've been looking at this hypothesis that maybe these polysaccharides are inducing viral clumping and that those clumps mm. have enhanced stability and maybe the clumps are the transmitted right, form. Right. And thinking about the genetic implications of that. So we've, we've done several different assays to look at that. We've done electron microscopy and we can see clumps mm. when we add LPS and they're not there otherwise. They're not huge, there may be 10 virions per clump. Um, we can do things like dynamic light scattering, which is a biophysical assay where you can measure particle size by you know, how light mm -hmm. scatters in a solution. And there we see increased size um, in the presence of these polysaccharides. And then we have a genetic assay, which is my favorite one. My background's genetics. And um, so we had made 10 genetically tagged viruses that we used for a lot of different things in the lab. And we're all taught that a single bacterial colony or 
a single viral plaque was initiated by a single founder landing at that place on the plate. But what if a clump initiates mm -hmm. that event? And so by taking those 10 genetically tagged viruses, we can ask, do, does a single plaque have more than one tagged mm -hmm. virus in it? And the answer is yes, in the presence of those mm -hmm. aggregation inducers. And because our assay for that just relies on plaques and RT-PCR, we can do it in vivo. So we orally inoculate mice, either antibiotic treated or not. And then we take their feces and we generate plaques and we ask, okay, how many of these plaques have more than one virus in them? And it's higher in the mice that have their microbes intact. Mm. And so we're thinking a lot now in terms of, is that the transmitted form? Does wow. that aid transmission? What does that do for evolution? Because we know that if you have more than one genome in a plaque that you can detect, it means that more than one virus was actively able to initiate yeah. replication. And so we've been thinking a lot about complementation, recombination. It's nearly like polyploidy. It's, 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 it's a way that, that a virus which has an em, a non envelope virus mm -hmm. can be polyploid because well, the capsid makes it so constrained that it couldn't possibly encapsulate two genomes. Mm. Right. But, but yeah. it can basically bring its brothers along with it right. and, and become. Well, it's it's kinda, it kind of almost is like. Um, segmented genomes, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? But with but individual. In bits. Yeah, so Bring in like, extra copies in case yeah. one right. is, yeah. It's like a retrovirus. Exactly, because they're, right? they're deployed. Mm -hmm. Well, that could, that could um, really stone a couple of birds. Um, you've got the particle to PFU problem, right. which mm -hmm. polio has a lot of particles that aren't going to productively that's infect, right. but they could be in these clumps and bring along an extra copy of the genome if that's the whole entry unit. Right. Um, and you could complement mutations because it's a very error-prone RNA virus. It's almost like you wrote my grant. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> right, so, so the idea is these viruses have roughly one error per my genome. My services are available for higher <laughs> yeah, I would pay. <laughs> um, the, for polio, most RNA viruses, they have roughly one error per genome, and that's going to inactivate a lot of the particles. Um, but if you have two viruses with different genome defects that undergo synchronous co-infection because they're forced to through aggregation, mm -hmm. yeah. you could get complementation of those defective proteins, sure. facilitate a couple cycles of replication, they could recombine. And the beauty of polio is we have all the genetic markers to test that. So we have temperature sensitive resistant, or temperature sensitive markers, drug resistant markers. And then we're also really curious about your idea with segmented viruses. Um, so this whole idea of genome reassortment, so the whole reason you have to get a different flu shot every year is that out in nature, in birds and swine, um, these viruses have multiple genome segments and a cell can get co-infected with more than one virus and then they randomly reassort and you get a unique novel variant. That if it has a selective advantage, it grows out. And I've always thought, you know, statistically, you know, these are incredibly rare events that a single pig or duck would be co-infected with two different viruses at the same time and the exi exact same cell would be co-infected mm. at the same time. Um, but what if there was some clumping mechanism, maybe that would facilitate synchronous co-infection. Um, and so to test that, we're collaborating with Terry Dermody's lab on RioVirus, which has segmented genome. And again, great model system, genetic markers, temperature sensitive, drug resistant. So we'll see if the frequency of gen genome reassortment increases if, if we can clump the viruses and so forth. Didn't, in your same polio paper, didn't you also show that Rio was dependent on the gut? Right, microbiome? that was a part of Sharon's yeah. original paper in collaboration with Terry's lab. We showed that Rio also relies on the microbiota right. for replication you know, pathogenesis. You sound very much like Carla, the way you adore, <laughs> adore genetics. <laughs> and, I, and if I remember, she also loved to look at the old literature as well. Yeah, that's true, she did. I remember her quoting a paper of George Pallotti from 1960 where they saw vesicles in polio infected cells, mm -hmm. which today we think are where the replication occurs. Right. So you, you learned well from, from Hi, Pallotti. Osmos. Yes. We have a, tw a tweet here from Layla who said, I'm watching this and it is wonderful. I love Dr. Pfeiffer. I want to hang out on her patio. <laughs> Laura's going to kill me. <laughs> going to get all these people coming. Well, no, How big is this patio? Yeah, <laughs> Hey, Paul, can we talk about measles and canine distemper virus a bit? Yes? Paramexaviruses. I thought you didn't do any work. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was looking at your papers in preparation for this, and when I searched for Dupre P, I you found nothing. Yep. 
because I have to search for WP. What's the W? So you can blame my mother on that. <laughs> she, she, she'll be very impressed that I've not, now mentioned her on Twiv because she might even be watching this in Ireland. So, hello, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> Has that ever happened on Twiv before? I don't think we've had it. Your mom could tweet you. Yeah, uh, yeah, she can, text, she can text me right now if she heard that. <laughs> um, my mom decided that William Paul sounded better than Paul William. Mm -hmm. So you're actually I don't know if you agree. Do you agree? I like W. Paul. W. Paul. W. Paul sound. Yeah, that could be. Why do you just? You, why don't you like William now? No. She never called me William. She called you Paul. I was always called Paul. She, okay. she likes the sound of William Paul, but she wanted to call me Paul, and I guess that's a mother's prerogative. I didn't have enough. Okay. Of that. I didn't have enough of that to say about it at the time. So if you want to find Paul's paper, you have to search for Dupre W. P. Well, actually, you right. don't. You don't have to. You search just at have all. to search for Dupre. Dupre? Because it's, it's, it's maybe unique, that it's right? unique. Yeah. yeah. I, I automatically did Paul because yep. I figured there no, were so it, many it's, Dupre's. Uh, in Dupre the world. Is, is very findable okay. on PubMed. I'm going to do it right now. D -U -P -R -E I put Dupre virus. Dupre virus. Oh, yeah, there they are. Okay. Okay. So I published them virus. Don't use P. <laughs> That's just a side <laughs> thing, which we never do on Twiv, of course. No, we never digress. Um, so uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, both. How does Stump Grinder work out? The stump grinder. Uh, the stumps are still there. No, actually. Well, you haven't hired them yet. No, they're oh. still there. Every time I cut the grass, I have to go around the stumps. It's really. This is the second arc. Excuse me. Second arc. Stump grinders. Stump grinders, needle. Oh, do we only have two arcs? Well, oh no, we're two in one episode's arc. pretty good. We're, we've got arc lamps here too. No. Um, oh. Oh. Um, one <laughs> I'm sorry. You were, you were talking about his papers. <laughs> I don't remember what I was. About you were talking to ask about PubMed and right, uh, papers. Paul's papers so come up. William Paul's you, papers come you up. You study measles. Let's start with measles, and I want to talk a little bit about canine distemper yep. virus. Measles you study in macaques. Is this correct? Well, actually, it, it's interesting listening to you talk about polio because the very first in vivo work that we did with measles. Mm -hmm was with an alpha beta interferon knockout mm -hmm. mouse which expressed a receptor, a transgenic animal, mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. which expressed CD46. Um, and that's, that's an interesting connection back to ARC, back to what you, you, you were just talking about, because we were working with, with mice, because the, the, the only animal model that you can use mice. Uh, yeah, the only proper natural infection animal model that you can do for measles is macaque. Okay. But that's very expensive and you have to collect an awful lot of data before you're able to convince anyone to look at the viruses that you've generated in such, such, and ethically as well, you have to really know what you're doing. So we started uh, basically being interested in measles neurovirulence. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't even a simple question of feeding them the, 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 the virus. We injected it at IC and then looked to see how the virus spread within the CNS. Mm -hmm. um, and that was at a time that we didn't even really know what the proper receptor for measles was. So this, this CD46 was a, a cell-associated um, in vitro artifact. It's not the actual receptor for mm -hmm. the virus at all. So from... Um, that small animal model of measles, we wanted to do something more natural. And again, this was in Belfast. We, we then were working with canine distemper virus. And canine distemper virus is, is really a very closely related cousin of measles. Mm -hmm. um, it, re, it has an awful lot of the similar attributes of uh, the infection of measles. Measles is incredibly, incredibly lymphotropic. It's epitheliotropic, and it's also a little bit neurotropic. I like this part. A little bit neurotropic. A little bit neurotropic. <laughs> Whereas CDV is like a soup of measles. It's very, very lymphotropic. It's much more epitheliotropic, mm -hmm. and it's very neurovirulent. Uh, and CDV is a pathogen of dogs. And right? CDV is a, well, it's called canine distemper virus, but you really could call it carnivore distemper virus because mm -hmm. CDV, again, unlike measles, measles is a long way down that evolutionary route. It's, it's exquisitely adapted to primates. Mm -hmm. CDV is not quite as far along that, so it infects a wide, wide range 
of, of um, carnivores, not just carnivores, but uh, a large number of different wildlife species in the States, for example, can be infected with it. Fisher cats. Uh, in the States, the raccoon population really, really replicate uh, um, massive numbers of raccoons, millions of raccoons in this country. We have raccoons on my patio. I have, yeah, we have a raccoon. <laughs> we have a raccoon in our back. Uh, uh, our trash cans just just are in the gar garden. I actually saw one when I was living in New York City. I saw They're one outside my apartment building running around under cars once. Uh, yeah, I had not seen them until I was in New York. Well, we just thought it was them. a giant rat. Yeah. So, no, come on, it's he a lived, raccoon. It's got a ring tail and everything. You yeah. live in Central Park. So anyway, the raccoon raccoon uh, uh, get, get it. But the interesting thing about CDV, it jumps into many different species. So for example, lions in the Serengeti. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, there was a very interesting, rather sad outbreak in Texas in the States. A big animal sanctuary mm -hmm. lost, I think, eight or nine of their big cats this that last year because of CDV. Is it because it's neurotropic? That's well, quite what, what so yeah, yeah. So CDV is is also very. The other hallmark of these viruses is they're really, really immunosuppressive. So they really, really infect massive numbers of immune cells. I see. And then again, linking back to what you're saying, this interplay between viruses and uh, other infectious agents, viruses with viruses, viruses with bacteria, mm -hmm. that allows secondary infections to take over, and that's that's. Now jumping back to measles, that's what leads to the death of, a, of, of the kids in Africa who don't get vaccinated mm -hmm. or who get exposed to measles before they're able to be vaccinated. These secondary infections are really, really very, uh, very uh, ready to jump in pneumonia uh, with the kids because of this, the, the immunosuppressive nature mm -hmm. of, of the viruses. So back to the original question, um, starting with a mouse for measles can't do the primate model. Mm -hmm. what, do you, what else do you look for? If, you, if you're really interested in pathogenesis, which my lab is, um, the CDV in a small tractable animal model, which is the ferret, mm. is a really, really very, very good way to study, up, study souped up measles. So we- What did you say, souped, souped up? up? Souped up souped measles. Up. Yes. Is, that, is that a word? Yeah. Sure. I can't oh, yeah. This I'm just yeah. trying to figure out what it means soup for measles. Soup. Souped up. Well, CDV Pimped is out. souped up measles, right? Yeah. Okay. So CDV. Okay. It's like measles on steroids. Got it. Okay. Except you wouldn't treat measles with steroids. So, so yeah. souped up measles is right. a better. Yeah. Souped up measles. Yes. <laughs> All right. So, um, yeah, it's really interesting. So you can take the CDV and you can infect the ferrets with it. Simple intranasal. Mm -hmm. Immunize, uh, sorry, um, inoculation. Does it spread by aerosol? Oh, CDV, ferrets? absolutely. Yeah, mm -hmm. really, really. Very, that's the other thing about these morbidly viruses. They mm -hmm. are now that smallpox is gone. The these viruses are the most infectious human. Well, measles is the most infectious human pathogen. The R naught is twelve to fifteen. Mm -hmm. Very, very infectious. Which is why, if, whenever people don't get vaccinated. You have an outbreak you in an outbreak. New York. Yep. Uh, you have a, there was there an outbreak in, it was, it, it was just outside Boston. We had right. a couple of people uh, in Trader Joe's. These are people who are not immunized. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and there's a big outbreak in the Philippines at the minute and an awful lot of cases are coming into Ohio mm -hmm. and uh, California, San mm -hmm. Francisco. Yeah, it's mostly people, mostly in communities that are not Im immunized, yeah. and then of course the vaccine is like 98, 99 percent effective. So you've got one percent of the after population. After two goes, Alan. After two right. shots as well. So there's some tiny percentage of the, of the vaccinated population that's mm -hmm. also susceptible, but it's mostly it, you. You get the nucleus of the thing going in a place where you have an unvaccinated population. So back mm -hmm. to CDV. So back mm -hmm. to CDV. Souped up. This is up really vaccines. very hard. Okay. Hard does anyone follow this? <laughs> they, they can rewind. See, it's live streamed, but they know they'll be able to back it up. So we did the infection with the CDV, um, and the other thing that we have really taken a, a back step with is we used a lot of lab-adapted viruses in the past. That's how I started. That's how, how I set the reverse genetic system up for measles using Martin Billiter's system from, from Zurich. Um, and these are viruses which are joined together from all that bits and pieces, scraps of this and scraps of that. They're not, they're not, they really don't represent proper clinical isolates. So we took a little bit of a back step with the CDV work and mm -hmm. took 
a, a, an isolate that we really knew the provenance of and knew that it caused disease in the ferrets and then took it and made a version of it which expresses green fluorescent protein which allowed us to really understand pathogenesis in fundamentally different ways because you literally can watch the virus uh, spread from cell to cell to cell to cell in the same animal over time as you bleed it day on day. Um, and, and then at the time of necropsy, whenever you're able to shine light on the animal, mm. you really get to see because of the fluorescence where the virus is and that allows you to do very, very targeted pathology. So instead of looking through this whole animal for the tiny bit of replication here and here and here, you can really focus straight in. Right. You can isolate that piece of tissue, you can block that piece of tissue and then do the pathology on it. So I think by collecting the data in the mice, this is why these transgenic, you really need to do that. And then going on to the ferrets and developing those types of approaches. Um, we then hooked, my lab has never worked with macaques in, in Belfast. We just didn't, didn't have that ability. But I have a, a colleague, um, a friend, in Erasmus Medical Center, Rick de Schwart. And we met in the European measles meeting. So there's a small group of us got together each year in Germany. And um, whenever he saw what we were presenting and saw the viruses and we chatted and he said, we really should do this experiment in macaque. Um, and he's an exceptional scientist, incredibly um, meticulous, very careful and, and has invested a huge amount of time in that, that model um, and does it very, very well. Uh, has a great team of, a team of, of, of people there as well that he's really uh, at the forefront and then he, we, we took one of the viruses and we, we, we did that natural infection of the macaque. So natural meaning respiratory? Yeah, so, so the, the, the guys in Rotterdam have established that model with an intratracheal uh, delivery. And the reason why they do intratracheal is because you can really be absolutely certain where the virus is going. So the very first time we did, and plus as well, you want to make sure if you're putting a small amount of virus in, mm -hmm. you want to make sure that the animals are actually going to be infected. You don't want anything. These are very expensive. Again, there's ethical considerations. To, to, to setting up uh, and to doing such an experiment. So you really want to make sure if you're going to ask that question, can we really understand measles pathogenesis in the optimal animal model? We better make sure that, that those animals are going to be infected. But in a natural infection, you don't get into tracheally inoculated. Absolutely. Right? But, but it, it affects the, up, the upper tract first, I no, presume? No. You inhale I, it deeply? Yeah. So this is what we wanted to ask the question. But mm. before you can ask that question, you want to make sure that A, the macaques are infected. You don't want to go in and infect 50 macaques with all these different roots and all these different amounts mm. until you know that you can, using the gold standard route, that you can infect them that you can understand when the peak of infection is, when the early uh, infection is, when the virus is cleared, and then use that knowledge to really ask the question. And, and again, it's back to understand primary pathogenesis. We did not know until we did those experiments were measles actually targeted the primary target cells of measles. Right, so you do, you do the ferret experiment to figure out where to look. Yeah. Then you do the initial macaque experiment with the intratracheal inoculation yep. to, to make sure that it works the same way in the macaque that yep. it did in the ferret. Yep. And then you can move further into the macaque model because then you've justified the, the investment yep. in that model yep. and you can follow through to there. So you go from yep. one model through to a more, a more human-like, yep. measles-like model. But because it's I mean, simply not trivial to do such, such the, these, these experiments. But in a macaque, yes. have you ever just aerosolized virus? Yeah. Where does it initially replicate? In so that was w what we, we did once we then were able to do all of this experiment. Right. We were interested in really understanding, as I always see it, measles is a really great system because you've got both sides of a coin. You've got the attenuation side, you've got a great vaccine that really works 
and you've got a really, really big disease, you can understand the, the, the pathogenesis. So you really can understand both sides of that coin. So no one knew where were the primary target cells. Mm -hmm. So the way to answer that question is exactly what you said. Aerosolized, give every single cell throughout the entire respiratory tract an equal opportunity mm -hmm. to pick up measles virus. I'm dying to know the answer. It's 10 deep, minutes since deep I asked lung. <laughs> So in the, in the deep lung, the It took him or, years to do this it took experiment. Years to do it. So in the you are going to listen to what you understand. But what you have to understand is where you really are, are looking, because the assumption, all those, all those textbooks, right, draw people away from... I wrote the from, textbook. Yeah. And it <laughs> says epithelial cells. It says epithelial cells. People imagine it's a respiratory virus. The re epithelial cells don't have that primary receptor. Okay. So right in the deep lung, there are alveolar macrophages, dendritic cells. Mm -hmm. And whenever we dialed back from the peak of infection, so day seven, day six, five, four, three, two, we got back as far as day two, you take the whole lungs and we inflate the whole lungs and then section the lungs. Mm -hmm. And literally you can look through the entire lungs and because of the fluorescence, it allows you to identify those cells in the deep lung. And then what happens from there, day two, day, day two infection, day three, four, there are small bits of tertiary lymphoid tissue in the lungs mm -hmm. and from the uh, uh, this is bolt bulk associated, associated lymphoid right. tissue and those are those are perfect for measles if you're a lymphotropic virus that's where you want to find so you're picked up by an alveolar macrophage mm -hmm. you find this little find in a very common this little bolt that is a perfect place you to replicate mm -hmm. replicate you've got all of this um uh, lymphoid tissue from there you go to the trick your bronchial lymph node if you um, if the uh, if the, the the root of infection is aerosol from the trick your bronchial lymph node you just go systemic um, systemic infection gets you back to the uh, uh, upper respiratory tract because remember the next thing that you're trying to do with measles is be transmitted mm -hmm. yeah. and then you have a problem you have this lymphotropic life cycle where you've always used cells of the immune system mm -hmm. but you're you are a respiratory virus so how do you get out and this was really just worked out in the last couple of years when chris richardson and roberto catania roberto was on to, was he talking about pvrl4 the the poliovirus like was yeah, before he, he talked did. a little bit yeah. about that so they they at the same time identified this poliovirus like receptor PVRL4 uh, molecule which sits on the basolateral surface of the epithelium mm -hmm. uh, and in the adherence junction and once the immune cell comes into contact with that adherence junction protein PVRL4 that acts as the uh, the route from the immune system into the epithelium and from the epithelium it goes to the apical surface and then gets spread. So I mean, where, where, in the, where in the lung is this happening? Is it? Well, this is happening now upper? in the upper respiratory tract. Right. So it's gone the whole way systemic sub-epithelial cells, immune cells, coming into contact with the adherence junction in the basolateral surface of the mm -hmm. epithelial okay. cells and then into the epithelial cells and then the glycoproteins are sorted to the apical surface and then the virus is released. I mean, it's beautiful. So this whole systemic just infection beautiful. is just a way for measles virus to get mm -hmm. from the bottom of the lung to the top. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So cool. It's kind of circuitous. It's beautiful. It? Yeah. I mean, it's when you, and when you see it, when you see pathogenesis, and when you see that development of initial target cells, amplification, further amplification, systemic spread, we just see the rash. You know, you think of measles, you think of red spots. Um, but what it has done before to get the whole way around, to get up into that, and then you can see in the nasal concha, and you can see in the, 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 the trachea, these beautiful epithelial cells, all infected, um, ciliated bronchial epithelial cells. Simultaneously elegant and convoluted. It, Very viral. Yeah, it is. It, it, it's, it's, but it, does it work? Yes, it's yeah. incredibly infectious. And can that virus get very effectively from the Philippines to New York or wherever it is? Absolutely. So in your infected macaques, yep. if you look later in an infection, when you're getting shedding in the 
upper tract. Yes. Do you see any infection of epithelium in the lower tract at all, or is it not bothering to infect there because it can't be transmitted? It's still present in the in the respiratory system. So it's yes, throughout the tract, right? It's heavily, heavily okay. infecting in the uh, the nasal concha. Do you know why it's more heavily infected littered. in the upper tract? I, I don't know. The, the, the issue probably is, um, I, I guess it's, there's an awful lot more about this adherence junction PBR four protein mm -hmm. that we really need to understand. It, it's it's. Uh, it might be a density of receptors. It might just be the physical. It's easier to get out of, of that. Uh, there, there, there are less layers of cells. It could be many, a multiple of just it's simple the microbiota. physical reasons. Microbiota. Why. Microbiota. And, then, <laughs> yeah, and then you have to think back to, and again, you see the lovely parallels as you're talking about the gut, and I'm thinking, now, I wonder what's happening there with the mucus. She do a sabbatical in her yeah. lab. I tell you. Sit on her patio. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that patio is full. It's pretty full. That patio is full. Is it big? <laughs> No. No. Okay. It's like a three or four seater. <laughs> but you see, could the you, other could thing. Could you aerosolize equally. species from it? <laughs> you can aerosolize species from anywhere. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. But the flip, the reason why that's important to understand is there's a project in the World Health Organization. They're trying to talk about uh, aerosol vaccine delivery. Really? Mm -hmm. Now, if you don't really understand primary pathogenesis, you don't know whether or not as you first asked the question, should I be delivering it to the upper? You could spend all of your time developing a beautiful project with the assumption that <laughs> measles is a respiratory virus and you just dab it on its nose and away you go. And no, without understanding the wrong primary place. pathogenesis, you, sh you cannot do any sort of proper translational work, which is uh, develop mm -hmm. a vaccine which might be very thermostable, could be a powdered vaccine like this, this company active dryer working right, on right. But they need to know where to deliver that and if you put it up here not a good place to go so they want to do this to avoid the injection yeah this would be right. really very attractive so again like we are for measles mm -hmm. yeah, yeah we're polio leads we follow so you're going to be eradicated mm -hmm. we're going to be eradicated mm -hmm. uh, uh, the question is what will happen after post eradication would you ever stop vaccinating should you ever stop vaccinating against measles? And then that links to where you started, and this is where you come back to CDV, and you come back to zoonotic infections, and you come back, because you know what? Give me measles, well, give me measles vaccine any day um, compared to CDV. I don't really would not want to have CDV. Uh, Does it affect people, CDV? Well, um, has it been used to vaccinate people against measles? Yes. No, but I'm wondering in the wild, do, you have, do humans ever acquire CDV? Are there zoonotic infections? Many well, the thing CDV. at the minute is it, where it would be, it certainly would not have, if it happened, right, if it happened, it would not be able to be seen here. You would have to have huge swathes of people who are not vaccinated. Okay. But remember that the interesting thing about these Borbilli viruses is they're a very, very close family. So mm -hmm. there's cross protective T cell uh, epitopes. So what I know is if I get measles, CDV is a very, very safe virus for me to work with because I am okay. not going to get infected with CDV. Can I, uh, because of the, the, the T cell, uh, the T cell immunity? So you're worried if you eradicate measles. So do you think you, we can eradicate measles at some point in the future? It's really interesting. People are not as convinced that it's possible. It is as possible as, as for, for some of the other viruses. The, the, the people really uh, dis disagree about that. Um, I think that it's people disagree about polio too. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I think polio, polio is I think might be even harder because you know it's a pretty stable virus that kicks around in the environment well, in sewage, for quite a long is period be of time, person to person. Exactly, and measles is is much more labile. And we use a vaccine for polio that back mutates. Yeah, that's, that's the issue. Problem, so po yeah. polio virus might be slightly easy, uh, slightly slightly harder than uh, than measles virus. Um, the issue is with people not taking the vaccine at the moment, and mm. this 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 anti-vaccine. Okay, so that that is not. But assuming, all right, let's assume. We eradicate one day. Are you worried if we stop immunizing, then these other more billy viruses could start infecting people? Well, what do you know about a virus? What do you know about viruses? They, they evolve to fill a niche. Yep. So I think I would like to know uh, what other more billy viruses are out there. Mm -hmm. 
And I think I would like to know what are the barriers to cross-species infection. I think that's incredibly important because, as I say, give me the CD, give me measles vaccine uh, much faster than measles mm. and give me measles vaccine and measles much faster than CDV because I've seen what that can do to the brain of a ferret and I don't want that anywhere near my brain. <laughs> well, and, uh, and we've seen with smallpox, right, aren't yeah. there pox viruses that appear yeah. to have... So their monkeypox the infections are coming in. And nobody got the, yeah. nobody got monkeypox yeah. when everybody yeah. was yeah. vaccinated against yeah. smallpox. Exactly. Yeah. Now we stop vaccinating against smallpox yeah. and we have monkeypox yeah. coming See, in. You have to under you have to really think about this. No generation has lived, been vaccinated, and got the whole way up to eighty or ninety years old and died vaccinated yet. Vaccination is quite a big experiment. Is that correct? Certainly for measles. Well, not for we smallpox, smallpox, it's not. Smallpox, yeah. it's not. Smallpox, we have generations So, so generations. if you're looking at what you're learning from monkeypox could be applied to polio virus, mm -hmm. could be applied sure. to measles, we, we sort of say lifelong immunity, and we hope that that's the case. And I'm sure probably is more than likely is going to be the case. But don't be under any uh, illusion. We, 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 that's something, we don't have the data for that. So we, can't, we, we don't know that. The, 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 uh, one of the main reasons of eradication programs is to stop immunizing at some point. You don't want to immunize forever, right? So if we can eradicate polio, the goal is to stop. Measles would be the same thing. We did what do you that think will happen problem. with polio? Do you think so polio is a very, stop? well, polio is a problem because the circulating vaccine-derived viruses are, are there. And if yeah. we switch to inactivated vaccine, which is the plan, the guts will not be immunized. It's so the those, new plan. So the new plan. That wasn't the original plan. The but. new plan, and those viruses will continue to circulate. Yeah. This is what happened in Israel. They found wild viruses in the sewage. Mm -hmm. No cases of polio because everyone was immunized with yeah. IPV, but the gut is susceptible. So I have this vision that we have to use IPV forever to protect us against the vaccine that we use to eradicate infection. However, even beyond that, there might be the coronaviruses out there that could move in. There are certainly Coxsackies that are neurotropic, that could evolve. To, and what's the one in, there's something in California, some... Well, there was, a, there was an outbreak of uh, a, a high reporting of acute flaccid paralysis, which is a syndrome that can be caused by many things besides viruses. Uh -huh. It's been associated with enteroviruses, but it's not at all clear that so that's not those clear cases yet. were caused by a virus at all. Okay. Yeah. But it's, I think in all cases, when you eradicate and stop immunizing, you have to wonder if, if there are other viruses out there that can substitute. And I think, as you said, we don't have enough information for most viruses to be able to answer the question. And it's a big experiment. So, yeah, and that's the sort of information I would like to collect. I think that that's important to know because we really will have to get to the point where those, those people, it would be so attractive to take measles out of the cold chain. Mm -hmm. That would be great yeah. if that was possible. But there are a number of reasons, zoonotic infections, and I mean, heaven forbid, um, you can make the virus. I, I don't think that errat I think eradication is, is in some ways a redundant concept in the, in, the, uh, <laughs> in the world of reverse genetics. It doesn't cost, it would cost, what, $10,000 to make a clone? It's not uh, that. Well, I mean, this is the ongoing debate about and whether that is something to that destroy is. the yeah. smallpox yeah. stocks yeah. because you could make them again anyway. Yeah. Why bother to destroy Why them? Why bother to yeah. destroy them? It's because a good question. Because it's the same as measles. Should we eradicate it or should we get rid of the, the stocks? Because I, I, you can recreate that for oh, yeah, next very to nothing in the lab. And bases. you know what? That would be a, that's an incredibly infectious agent. And, and yeah. I'm not, again, sure that the world would want to be more bilivirus naive. Big, uh, those are questions for people uh, with bigger brains than me. <laughs> Unfortunately, I think they're decisions being made by people who don't necessarily have bigger brains. Uh, Paul, uh, I wouldn't like to have to make those decisions. I want to ask you one last thing. So your student, Connor, just defended, right? He did. He's a, he was working in uh, Belfast. He didn't want to come here and join you in Boston. I was in, well, he, he, uh, he didn't, we didn't think that that was a good idea. So I went back to Belfast last, not last Friday, but the Friday before. And he defended his his thesis four hours, <laughs> four hours, hours, hours. shower. I can't, I can't understand his accent. I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't think I had an accent. No, you don't. They're going to do subtitles on this, right? <laughs> All right. Well, congratulations, Connor. Yeah, that's good. He's, he's, he's might now be listening. hepatitis C. He's going to Glasgow, right? Hepatitis C person with John McLaughlin in right. uh, good in Glasgow. Good luck. He's a he's a twit fan. Um, 
I want to do some picks. What do you think? Sure. To, to wrap picks. it up, what do you have today? Pick uh, of the week? What I have, let me scroll down. We have these show notes in Google Docs, which we, um, we paste in letters to the show. So if you've sent a letter to TWIV, <laughs> it's somewhere in this <laughs> massive, massive set that I Scrolling. Does it have a page? Is there a page? Uh, oh, here we go. Yes. So my pick this week is um, it's an article on a site called Persephone Magazine. Uh, it's called I Will Not Follow the Herd. And um, I, I found this absolutely wonderful. Um, it's by somebody writing under the name Susan, which I think is a pseudonym for reasons that will be obvious once you read this article. Um, it will probably offend people who you don't want to use your real name in offending, but um, it's, it's about uh, making intelligent decisions for your children and, and how, you know, after searching through Google for quite a while, she's, she's realized that um, she made a lot of mistakes with her first child and she's not going to make the same mistakes with her second child and in buying into all of the, the PR and hype that you get from the big safety industry. Uh, and, and the dangers of, of things like seat belts and other things that we've been, that we've been sold. Um, and uh, you, will no you may notice some similarities between the arguments made here and arguments you may have heard elsewhere. I'll just leave it at that. That's great. Yeah, highly recommended so. short. Could read it quickly. Yeah. yeah, it's about a two minute read. All right, my, my pick is very self reflexive. It's <laughs> ASM Live, which is what we're doing right now. <laughs> but there are also other sessions at ASM Live besides TWIV this morning. There were two uh, by Stan Malloy, who was standing over there before. And uh, there will be two tomorrow morning and two the following day, I believe. So they're really nice. They are, they are streamed live. And the way the streaming works is if you come in halfway, you could actually start from the beginning. So it's pretty neat. So uh, check out ASM Live Micro So it's like Twivo. Yes, right. Exactly. I got that one. I got it. It is. It's a DVR um, on the microworld.org website. I have a, a listener pick from Neil. It's pretty cool. Dear TWIV, I noticed the listener pick animation of DNA replication from Marshall in TWIV number 278 and thought you would appreciate some more animations of this kind. The DNA animation is the work of biomedical animator Drew Berry. I believe that you read a letter discussing his work on TWIP number 24. You can see more of his work on the YouTube channel WeHi Movies. WeHi is the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute of Medical Research in Melbourne. And he, he gives us a link to the YouTube channel. Very cool animations there. For the past year, Drew has been working with three trainee animators as part of a visual, visualization project called VisiB Plus. Their animations, The Hungry Microbiome, Cancer is Not One Disease, and Inflammation and Type 2 Diabetes have just been released and are available at the VisiB Plus website, which he gives a link to. I hope you agree that these are both scientifically informative and visually very striking. They're gorgeous animations. I These looking, are cool. Looking at the one where they have a molecule of DNA that's being bound by histones and wrapped up. Yeah. It's just gorgeous. You know, these science it's like animations. We're not on Skype, so I can actually watch the YouTube video while we're doing <laughs> yeah, this. Yeah, it's, it's cool. not going to play. Oh, there it's you not, go. Yeah, I'm not, I don't have the sound on, so you Very can't nice. Hear it. So you guys don't want to pick anything, do you? I actually would like to say something about that. Um, it's a tweet from earlier on this week, and, and since you've asked, uh, there's a really, uh, you know oh, that I'm right. passionate about vaccinations and measles vaccination in particular. There is a really, really great uh, movie mm -hmm. made by a high school film club in Carlsbad, um, California. They, they basically made this, this movie called Invisible Threat. Do you know this? Yes, I was. And, and this is something which really going deserves, to be a pick. honestly, well, this is something that deserves our, su pick. our support as far as. Uh, a little bit of uh, a little bit of publicity on Twiv. The, these kids have done a tremendous job. Uh, I was in touch with their teacher this week, uh, Lisa Potsard, and she sent me the, the full. She's sending me the full uh, movie. But they have have very carefully, very methodically, and incredibly professionally mm. put together a, a, a movie called Invisible Threat about. The importance of vaccination, and they interviewed people, uh, and I, 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 I think it's a, it's a real credit to them. They're getting some some um, uh, flack uh, oh, in the in from the, exactly the anti-vaccine lobby yeah. from the from the usual yeah. suspects, and I think uh, giving attacking a group of high school students just because they have gone and and 
looked at the evidence and made their own decision that vaccines do not cause autism, that this, this, uh, this is, is all uh, blown up out of all proportion. I, I give them yeah. great credit. So I think it would be wonderful if you could post that pic uh, and put some sort of a link to, to yeah, this, this sure group of people. This would be great. So you did tweet it to me last week. I, I tweeted it, but, and, I, and I, I thought to myself, sure. if I get the chance today, I'm going to give them a, a little bit of a plug. How could you not have a chance? Well, you never know. I'll I keep an think, eye you're on not you. a guy that doesn't. Well, never mind. Julie, you want to pick anything? I'll, I'll, I'll find something to send you. You'll okay. find something. No problem. We don't want to put you it on the It will not be a, a biological. Link be later. Patio, anyway. something from the patio. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a box. <laughs> oh, nice. Oh, nice. <laughs> Picture of the patio. On <laughs> this patio, do you have drinks? Uh, yeah. What do you drink? <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you drink on the patio? What do we drink? Beer, wine, margaritas. Uh, What's your favorite? Used to be red wine. We recently switched to white. <laughs> Laura's doing an experiment. Ah, I see. <laughs> I can imagine that experiment. All right, that's Twiv286. You can find it at twiv.tv, also on iTunes. And if you like it, we don't charge you money for it, but please go to iTunes and subscribe. It's free. And make a comment or leave some stars that helps to keep us visible so more people find us. We, we're really lucky to have lots and lots of subscribers and great fans, but we want more. And so please do that. And if you have any questions and comments, we usually read them on the show. Eventually. Eventually. We will get to every single one of them, except the ones where Alan tells me not to read them. <laughs> like halfway through the first sentence, right? You've done that before. No, no, there, there are only a couple of, a few of those. people you can, who've written repeat letters on the same subject. <laughs> we know who they are. Yes. Anyway, you can send your letters, email to twiv at twiv.tv, and uh, we'll be happy to read them. I want to thank our guests today for joining us. Paul Dupre from Boston University. Thanks. Very good to be back. It's fun to have you, and I uh, hope you enjoyed your second time. Come back, OK? Well, you can come back. The, 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 you should be coming back to us. So maybe whenever we start to open needle, you'll come and do a twib from that. Huh? You'd be so happy to always, Alan. Dubs if we have, a, so if we away. have a, a symposium to begin with, let's let's that put a great. twib in the symposium, All huh? Right. That would be great. Yeah. Julie Pfeiffer uh, from a backyard in Dallas somewhere, <laughs> Southwestern University in Dallas. Thank you so much for joining. Thanks for having today. me. It's fun. We appreciate it. You should come back too as well when you figure out this gut business with yeah. Elio. Okay, you can tell us about it. And Alan Dove, thank you. Thank you. Always Alan, a pleasure. Alan Dove is on Twitter, and he's also right now. He, yeah, <laughs> I, mine died. I don't know what happened. Did oh, we get any uh, questions uh, that we, we should got, answer? We um, There are some uh, da, 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 careful aerosolizing feces. Sounds like dual use. Very good point. Yes. <laughs> I, I could probably think of more than two uses. Um, <laughs> Oh, it's great to finish on a high point. Oh, here's a good one. <laughs> Given pro and antivirulence interactions between viruses and bacteria, why so little virology at ASM meetings? Well, that's wow. a topic for an entire show, right? We'll that's let other people other handle thing. that question. Yeah, that's, that's buried in history. Um, Alan Dove is at turbidplaque.com. That's his blog. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws soon to be in a backyard in Dallas, I guess. I want to thank uh, ASM for letting us do this here at the general meeting. We really appreciate it. And my phone stopped buzzing. Is that your phone? It's my phone buzzing. You. My mother. And I particularly want to, <laughs> your mother is, is, see if it's actually your mother. Yeah. It's not? No, it's not. Okay. <laughs> I want to thank, I thank the ASM. I want to thank the people behind the scenes. Warren, thank you very much. Ray, the camera guys, and Chris Kandayan, our invisible producer. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> uh, you've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Once you're in the BSL-4 space, the only way you can get out is to go through a chemical shock. It's an unusual room, never seen anything like this. Anybody who has access to this facility first has to go through an R scan. So 
the HIPAA filters filter the air coming out of the facility and that will remove bacteria, viruses, anything that might constitute any kind of risk, right? Remember this building is, is basically a second building inside the main building.